Jesus walking on water. That preaches so easily, doesn't it? Jeez. We're going to continue on in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to pick up immediately following what we dealt with last week. This is good, Matthew. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by waves, was far out from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me, come out, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord of wind and fire and calm and peace, all of, all of this, all of the world, all of the people gathered here wait to hear your word. Open us to what you would have us learn and know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like most preachers, Jesus kept trying to get away. If you think about it, this story follows the account of the feeding of the multitudes. And that story began when Jesus tried to get away for some time of prayer and time to grieve the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. Remember last week, thousands upon thousands of people were on the hillside. They heard stories of the kingdom of God. They ate their fill of bread and fish and then they were sent off on their way home, at which point Jesus sent his disciples on ahead to the other side in a boat so that he could finally get the quiet time he had been searching for for the past couple of days. And somewhere in the night, the storm arose, and Jesus came to the aid of his disciples walking on the water. Now, Matthew does not want us to miss the importance of Jesus' prayer life with the miracles and the mighty acts and deeds that he does. Jesus goes off to pray and feeds thousands upon thousands of people. Jesus goes off to pray, and he walks on water. Prayer time. Prayer life and miracles go hand in hand. They did in the time of Jesus. They still do today. Later in the story, when Peter is walking on the water, he begins to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. Peter's prayer and our prayers are, sound pretty much alike, don't they? Peter prayed, we prayed in the midst of the storm. Jesus prayed, before the storm. Matthew, again, doesn't want us to miss the importance of that. It is Jesus' prayer before the storm that allowed him to stand upright in the midst of the storm and assure his disciples 
You do not need to be afraid. Now, I have a trick question for you. How many characters are involved in this story? Obvious answer is 13, Jesus and 12 disciples. I think for Matthew, there were really only three. Jesus speaks and acts. Peter speaks and acts. The other disciples speak and act as one. So Matthew is only really dealing with three characters. And it's important that we recognize this because it highlights how important one person can be to the entire community of faith. When Jesus walked on the water coming, towards the board, coming toward the boat, the disciples were terrified. By the end of the story, they are in worship. Between fear and worship is one disciple risking to step out of the boat, one disciple who was rescued by Jesus, and they enter in when they all get back into the boat, everything calms. The storm calms. The disciples calm. They worship Jesus, saying, really, truly, you are the Son of God. The risk of one believer stepping out in faith, trusting that Jesus is leading the way, made a difference on all of the, all of the disciples. I've been thinking a lot about my first church, Center Presbyterian Church. The second service today, Alex Loy is going to be playing the saxophone. Alex was one of my kids at my first church. He was, I don't know, eight, maybe nine, maybe ten when I left. He has since graduated from Lebanon Valley College. He is now teaching somewhere in Baltimore, um, and, and Jim got hold of him as a saxophone player and invited him to come and play, so he's going to be here second service, and I'm really excited about seeing him again because he was about yay big, and he's no longer yay big. But I got to thinking about Center Church, got to thinking about um, that they're celebrating, if they haven't celebrated, they're about to celebrate 250 years of existence there in Perry County. And I got to wondering what that first pastor must have gone through as he rode his horse over the mountain, down through the woods and the forest, sort of waved to the Indians, the Native Americans there, gathered those first people together to worship there on the hillside in Louisville. You guys, Frieden's Church is over 200 years old. What must it have been like for that founding pastor and those first members to gather together trusting that God was doing something with them? We are the recipients today of what they started 200 years ago, 250 years ago. What they did made a difference in our lives today. As I'm sure you can tell, one of the recurring themes in this passage is fear. In 11 verses, Matthew uses the phrase, cried out in fear, were terrified, became frightened, and do not be afraid. Fear plays a major role in this passage. Fear, unfortunately, I think plays a major role in our lives as well. How long did it take you to get back on an airplane after September 11th? Anyone planning a trip to West Africa to help the people who are dying because of the Ebola epidemic? For that matter, anybody planning a trip to Israel anytime soon? Fear is a part of our lives. You have a call committee, a search committee that is looking for your next pastor. Their job is to discern the will of God. 
I'm sorry, that's a frightening concept to even think about, trying to discern the will of God. And you have candidates who are trying to discern if it is God's will for them to come to this church. Discerning the will of God should scare the bejesus out of everybody. As wonderful as you guys are, let me assure you, thinking of coming here is scary and exciting all at the same time. Every person involved in this process are like Peter taking that first step out of the boat, wanting desperately to follow Jesus, and yet scared to death of the storm that is swirling around them. Fear is a part of our lives. The disciples saw Jesus coming toward them, and they were terrified. We are invited some 2,000 years later to trust this itinerant preacher who wandered the highways and the byways and now the waterways of that little country, like Peter, taking that first step towards Jesus is scary. And whether it is Jesus coming towards us or, or us moving towards Jesus or just caught up in all of the things that are going on in our lives, fear can take over. But if we listen carefully, we can hear Jesus calling out to the disciples, calling out to us, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now that sentence is a lot more powerful than our translation makes it. When Jesus says, it is I, he is using the same words that God used with Moses there at the burning bush. With that one phrase, I am, and that awesome scene of Jesus walking on the water with the storm swirling around him, all of this unfolds to the disciples as, as they are sitting in that little boat, and Jesus identifies himself with God, the liberator and redeemer of Israel, the creator of the universe, and the victor of chaos. Can you see that, see that in your mind? Here is the great I am traipsing over the waves in the midst of the storm. What a powerful image that had to have been for them. It is in the commentaries that I read as I prepared for the sermon this passage of Peter going under the water, many ministers use as a symbol for baptism. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you look at this baptismal font, does this remind you of a storm raging around? Even if you're from a tradition that uses full immersion for baptism, do those heat-controlled fiberglass-lined pools remind you of a storm? If anything, the danger, the storms that come, come become part of our lives after baptism. Because becoming part of God's kingdom, becoming part of God's church is going to put us at odds with much of the world. You parents who bring your children for baptism, there is great risk. There is great trust. There is great commitment. But if anything, Jesus' baptism of us, Peter coming up out of the water, are images that we have following our baptism. That's when the storms arise. That's when we often cry out with Peter, Lord, save me. And that's when we hear Jesus calling out to us as he grabs our hands and pulls us out, out, of, out of the water. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do we doubt? Why do we doubt? in the presence of the one who is constantly 
conquering all of the storms that we get ourselves involved in? Why do we doubt when we know we are loved and saved and can never go where God will not be present with us? Why do we doubt? And yet we do. Peter stepped out of the boat trusting Jesus. Even though the wind and the storm scared him, Jesus never let go of Peter. Peter's risk, even though he started to sink, created an even deeper trust in the steadfast love of the one that he knew would be with him forever, who would never let him go. And it took Peter the rest of his life to learn that lesson. We have our entire lives before us to learn that lesson as well. In a few chapters, Jesus is going to remind Peter of this moment when he told everyone that even if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed and you say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it moves, and nothing will be impossible for you. Stepping out of that boat was one of those mustard seed moments for Peter. None of the other disciples were willing to get out of the boat. But because of Peter's mustard seed moment of faith, something that began in terror ends in worship. Thanks be to God. Amen.